Whatever. Thank you so much for having me. Also here at Word uh, Alumnus myself. It's a great honor to be able to return even virtually to my university, you know, 23 years later. So yeah, thank you for having me. So just a brief uh, note about me. Uh, besides the fact of, as you can probably see, I'm a hardcore Trekkie, yeah? Uh, I am principal lecturer at the University of Brighton, where I teach narrative design, game design, and design thinking. My research is focused on game-based learning, and I also facilitate some educational script and workshops. The next one is going to be taking place in, in October at the uh, European Conference on Game-Based Learning in the Netherlands. So if anybody plans to attend that, just come and say hi. And now, oh, one more thing. Uh, sometimes in some of the slides, you notice some letters that kind of stand out. They're there for a reason. So if you just know, you know, spot them, write them down. That's kind of a code. But yeah, that's a very minor thing. So uh, without further ado, uh, just a brief, um, some brief information about how I got into the escape rooms and all that. So when I was growing up in the 80s, my first uh, PC game was King's Quest 3. That was a uh, Sierra Adventure game. It was the point technically, you actually had to type the commands. And I was young and I did not speak any English. But I really liked the game, so that motivated me to, you know, buy a dictionary and start studying English so I can learn how to re-understand English so I can finish the game. And I managed to do that. And I thought, man, you can actually learn things just by playing games. And then, because I did my, before I got into the gaming and all that, I was into cybersecurity. So back in the late 90s, I did some hacking and my dissertation on cybersecurity and all that. Uh, I played in the, uh, well, almost 10 years ago, I think it was, eight years ago, a game called Hacknet. And that was kind of, it reminded me of what I used to do ages ago. And I thought, man, that is one cool way to introduce people to hacking. So without getting too technical. And said, so, okay, so again, you can learn by just playing games. And then I played the Black Watchman. I don't know if anybody has played that. For me, it was just a groundbreaking experience. It changed everything. I said, man, it's a super hard game. It's an alternate reality game. It's available on Steam. Uh, it plays like an escape room, in a sense, but you actually have to go to real websites and you know solve puzzles. It's hard puzzles, super hard, but you know once you solve them, it makes you feel great. And I thought that is... I learned so many things just by playing that game because I had to do my own research from what the Soviets did and the, the Americans during the Cold War era, all those secret experiments and things about the occult and things about cryptography, all cool things. And there was no way I, I was just going to do this on my own. Just by, I was so immersed in the whole of the game, I just uh, uh, wanted to learn more. And then I, uh, I got hold of the um, Escape Room in a Postcard thing uh, developed by some guys in the States. I have the, the, the links, uh, I'll show you the links later on. And I thought, whoa, that is a very cool way and cost efficient way to produce an escape room, just a postcard. How can I do that? I thought it was super cool. And that made me think, you know what? Actually, yeah, you can use escape rooms as a way to, to educate people with, uh, while having fun at the same time. And then I went to an escape room. There was a physical escape room. and I will never forget this puzzle. So there was a fish tank and it was full of water and afloat you could see a piece of, uh, a piece of wood. There was something written on it, but you know, I could not read that because of the, of the water level, it was too high. Inside the room, I found a hose, I found a bucket and I thought, right, so what I probably need to do is what I've seen in the movies, start from the water up. And I did, and that is a life skill. We know with the price of petrol nowadays, I can definitely use that skill to steal some petrol. I thought that is super cool. You can get this kind of life skills just by playing an escape room. And also that is something that's so memorable. I'll never forget that. So I thought, cool, let's see if we can just use that in the classroom for, for teaching purposes. And that brought me to, uh, actually, yeah, there's something like that. that brought me to 2019. And that is when I started teaching a module called design thinking. That is for a, that was for a, a master's course on user experience design. So the students were not game developers. They were not e, they were not e-learning specialists. They were just UX people, right? They had no ideas about games. 
And I thought the assignment I could give them is, you know, something, yeah, make an app, redesign an app, all those things that you do in UX, create a user interface. That's dull and boring. It's been done to death. Let's make them be creative. So for the past five years, I've been asking my students to design educational escape rooms for their uh, design thinking module. We've got more than 60, I think, developed so far. And some of them were sent to the competition, so they got shortlisted and all that. And it was great experience. And, you know, that made me think, let's see what kind of ways I can use to, you know, to come up with a, uh, a way to uh, make some kind of a list of things to do, you know, to design an escape, an, an escape room. So what I'm going to be doing today for the next, you know, 50 minutes or something, uh, I'm going to be telling you, introducing you to a framework uh, about how you could go about design escape rooms. But before we do that, I would like you to just have a look at this. So this is this is the first side of an escape room in a postcard that was designed by people from the states. They'll call the Simpson Inga Emporium, and they gave this away. It was found through Kickstarter. It was cheap, I think ten pounds or something to buy the postcards, a set of five, six postcards, and they made this available for free during the pandemic. So I don't think they're going to get sued by, you know, promoting that, that work. So I'll give you five minutes. So as you can, let me just tell you a little thing about that. So what do you see in this postcard is, well, actually, there are two puzzles in this postcard. One is this one. And the other one is everything else up besides that part. Okay. So there's something here, a hidden message, a word. I would like to, I'll give you five minutes. You can use the internet if you want to solve that puzzle. Don't waste your time with this one. Okay. Just skip that. Everything else goes. Okay. Uh, you're free to use the internet, of course, unless you do know who this guy is. And if you, if you manage to get it, just, you know, write in the chat room, got it. And I'll give you a few hints in a couple of minutes. And the reason why I'm doing that is because I want to show you how you can make an escape room kind of educational on a budget. So just pay close attention, all the manual details. You can use Wikipedia. That should be enough. I don't know who it is and what background it is. I'm not sure what we're looking for as the answer there. Okay, right. So, uh, need of a coffee? <laughs> Probably need some coffee, yeah. Okay, so for those of you who find out who this guy is and what he's famous for, can you see anything in the postcard that resembles what he's famous for? Uh, yeah. All those notifications, I have no idea how you make them stop appearing. Uh, okay, so yes, it has to do with the periodic table of elements. That is correct. 
So if that re reminds you, results of predictive of elements, do you spot anything unusual on those boxes? You have some letters. Uh, it is a single, uh, it's a single word. Six letters. It's not a Dutch word. I don't know if we, it's definitely an English word. Okay, so helium, no, yeah, that is correct, Michael, but that is an anagram. So, what does that spell? That is correct, yes. Haley got it. So, the word is Athens. Woohoo, we have a winner here. Congratulations. I'll give you a virtual uh, candy now. All right. So, you might think, okay, what was this all about? So, if you had a look at the periodic table of elements, because if you if you Google this person, he's, he may came up with the idea of the periodic table of elements. It looks like this. And if you have a look at the dots, one, two, three, four dots there, if you see where those dots appear on the periodic table of elements, you've got helium, you've got, where's the other one? You've got uh, sulfur there, uh, there's a T somewhere. Yes, there you go. So it spells Athens. As for the other part, oh, it doesn't have that font. Too obscure. Yeah, it is obscure, but uh, see, here's a connection. This person is possible. He came up with a periodic table of elements. You look it up, you find those uh, elements there, and it's an anagram, and it spells the word Athens. Now, uh, there's a, another part of this uh, postcard, the other side. I'm just, I'm not going to ask you to solve that because it's going to take a whole hour, and we don't have time for this. But uh, let me just show you something. If you have a look at the other part of the puzzle is missing. This is uh, actually uh, a seven segment display. So what do you have to do? It doesn't, didn't have my phone. That's the reason why the, this slide did not display this in the way it should be. If you complete all the segments that are missing, that gives you this number. If you look it up, that is a telephone number for a bank in Athens. So you have, Story-wise, you have a bank in Athens, and if you have a look at the other slide, at uh, the other side of the um, of the postcard, you get this. So uh, the way to solve this is: Can anybody guess what that thing is on the left side? Anybody in the chat? What does it look like? Anybody with a background in chemistry? something in the chat what is that yes that is correct atom electrons so if you actually count the number of all those electrons that gives you a number of 79 and if you go back to the periodic number of elements you see that the uh the element with the atomic number of 79 is gold so we have a bank in athens we have gold and then you have the stamps those stamps uh these actually are bank robbers, but I won't expect you to know that. These are famous bank robbers. But if you look at those tiny numbers there, that is uh, the atomic weight of elements. So if you go back to the periodic table of elements and you find out what elements they belong to. Yes, atomic weights, that is correct. And that spells B, the A-R-S, bars. So we have Athens, we have a bank, we have gold, we have bars, and we have the, those robbers there. And finally, you have this message that is encrypted. And this actually, these are symbols of elements. Again, if you look them up from the periodic table of elements, you'll see that those, they, give, they have an atomic number between 1 and 26. They don't go more than that which make you think, right, 1 to 26 could be a letter. So let's start with this one, for example. Uh, the F, that's the atomic symbol of fluorine. It has an atomic number of 9. 
So the ninth letter in the alphabet is the letter I. So you do the same thing for everything and you get this message. Yeah, your brain is melting. I know because it's, you, we have to do this in five minutes. If you have an hour, trust me, you'll solve that. Eventually you'd get there. So I've been using this a lot in the class. And imagine if you can just use something like this. Let's say that you're teaching chemistry at school, right? And you want to introduce, if you, if you follow the flipped classroom approach, you might want to introduce students to the periodic table of elements. And you give them that. You give them access to Wikipedia, whatever they want, and they can just figure something out. They can spend a lot of time, but they can actually find this. Or imagine that you've just taught that and you just want to assess the knowledge. So have some kind of a quiz. Instead of having a quiz in the class, you know, multiple choice or whatever, give them that. This is going to be much more playful, much more engaging, and hopefully much more fun. Okay. And of course, yeah, you have to do this with a team. It works best if you collaborate, of course. You can do this on your own, but you can do this with, uh, with uh, friends. So with that in mind, I thought, yeah, you can actually do something like that, and it's going to scope them even in a postcard, and it's not going to cost you a lot. That, how much would that thing cost? Just, you know, print two sides of a postcard, and that's just about it, okay? So with that in mind, I thought, you know, oh, I, I, I don't know about you guys, but every time I have to go to the, the, some of our training at uni, health and safety, fire, cybersecurity, it's just, Pop or it's just watching videos, skip, 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 next, 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 uh, multiple choice, done. And I feel like this guy. But if you're in an escape room, most of the times you end up looking like that. And I thought, okay, so how about doing something like that for training? And I tried, uh, we developed some escape rooms for cybersecurity training, and it was good fun. And most of the people that actually left the room after we did that, look like the people on the right. There was uh, one um, exception to that rule. Uh, because, you know, with educational escape rooms, it's not just about educating people or assessing their pre-existing knowledge. It's also about making people change their behavior. So when we did the cyber security escape room, I had a list of the participants before they, they came to that event. And I just looked them up to see what kind of, uh, what information I could find out about them that they made themselves available online. And I can I found out one person's home address. So he made this available online. So the final puzzle, the meta puzzle to that escape room about cybersecurity uh, had uh, players find an, uh, um, a set of coordinates. And then when they enter this on Google Maps, there you go, that person's the photo of that person's house. And he was scared to death when he saw that. And I said, well, I didn't do any hacking. That is information that you made available online, not me. So hackers can actually get access to that. And that was an effective lesson. So that I think that this actually made that pers person change all of his information online. So yeah, you can scare people off, but you can also educate them. Anyway, it was much more effective compared to going to an online training about cybersecurity, blah, 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 just videos, talking heads, and skip, skip, next, next. So I thought, right, uh, okay, let's go ahead and do that. But how are we going to design an escape room? That's the thing. There's some frameworks available. Uh, people try different ways to do that. But as I have a background in user experience and design thinking, I thought, let's see if we can actually apply design thinking principles to an escape room design. So for those of you who are not familiar with uh, design thinking, uh, that is a method that is used by designers to create innovative solutions to prototype and test. And it all, it all starts with understanding your users, understanding the human needs, what motivates people, so that you can define a problem that you're trying to solve, you can frame that, and then you move on to solving the problem. Because the reason why I thought of that is because most of the times when I talk to people who uh, design, design escape rooms in the past, they said, yeah, yeah, we'll just come up with a puzzle or come up with a story. And I thought, actually, have you actually thought about your users? The actual people are going to be playing your game. In design thinking, you have to get to know your audience first, define the problem, and then try to solve it. 
which is kind of similar to what Einstein said. He said, if I had 60 minutes of a problem, I'll spend 55 minutes defining the problem and just five minutes solving it. Super important. So with that in mind, I thought, yeah, let's come up with a framework that follows design thinking principles. So I've got this room to educate framework. It borrows elements from design thinking. It's focused on learners. It has this kind of prescribed nature, which makes it easy to you know, uh, use that. It has uh, eight stages. These are verbs, not deliverables. So you can just you know, think of it as a recipe. You can just go and tweak it and do whatever you want. And it looks like that. When we start with the empathize phase, so in the next minutes, I'm, I'll try to explain briefly how that thing works. In the empathize phase, what we do is we need to get to know our audience, our, our learners, our users. Then once we do get to know who they are, what their needs are, what motivates those people, what frustrations they've got, what their pain points are, then we move on to defining the problem. We come up with a problem statement, smart goals, uh, identify the learning objectives. We have to think about metrics. How are we going to be measuring? Well, what are we doing? Because that's another issue. If you go to your higher ups at work or at the university or whatever and tell you, you know, I want to design a discussion escape room and I need time for this or I need money for that, they're going to tell you, okay, how are you going to prove to me that it works? So you have to think about metrics. How can we measure that? How can we measure success? Most of the times, if you, you know, at least in the past, this has started to change. If you re re read some research papers, what is usually missing is the test, the um, assessment, the evaluation phase. They just said, yeah, yeah, we talked to some students and they said they loved it. But that is not enough to convince the higher up. So I'll talk about evaluation later on. So we define the problem. We have to figure out how we're going to assess the whole thing, the, uh, the effectiveness. Then we Try to contextualize that, start themes, settings, a story, and all this. We move on to design, which is the most fun part, come up with the puzzles and all that. And then we design the briefing, how we're going to brief the, our players, the debriefing session, how we're going to debrief that. Uh, and then we move on to prototyping, and finally we evaluate that. But of course, you know, you can always return to a previous phase. Uh, if after your play testing, you find that there's some things that need to be changed. So, but before you start doing anything, you should not panic. You should be aware of the fact that, that design an escape room requires a lot of effort. So working in a team for your own sanity is highly recommended. And you can even start, you know, simple, just use Google Forms or Genially. But what actually was, uh, uh, a game changing thing for me this year was AI tools. I have been using ChatGPT all the time now and me journey to design escape rooms. That has sped up the whole process immensely. So how do we start? We start with the empathize phase. So at the beginning, we need to know who we are designing an escape room for, what we're trying to solve, and we need to get information from our, about our learners. How can we do that? We should get, ideally, if you have the time, uh, we should get both qualitative and quantitative data. So you can have surveys, uh, you can just uh, get data from the, your VLE, the virtual environment, or you can also interview some of the students that belong to your target audience, run focus groups, observe them in the class, and you can even speak with the supervisor or the stakeholders, so you know, the, with the teacher, with the lecturers and all that. This information, once you gather that, oh, by the way, you can use ChatGPT to help you create questions for the surveys and the interviews and all that. It's going to speed up the process. Once you collect all of this data and you analyze that, then you can create a learner persona. A persona is like a fictional per person. It doesn't really exist. You just give the person a name and a, a photo and add some generic traits that characterize uh, a part of your target audience, of, uh, of your learners in that case. So by doing something like this, you have one way to visualize this information that is really important. It's going to help you define the problem that you're trying to solve and come up with solutions to this. And we move on to the problem statement. 
So once so assuming that you you know who you're designing for, what they want, or what their needs are, and all that, it's time to come up with your problem statement. We are trying to solve a problem. So you need to know who's affected by this problem, what the problem is, where does it take, where it takes place, and why it really matters. The moment you actually put this into a statement and you share this with your team, then everybody in the design team has a common focus. And also, you know that this solution is going to come from needs of your users, not from you. Because most of the times, what do we do is we just think, we assume that that is a problem that we're trying to solve without actually talking to the users themselves, to the learners. And this can be problematic. So it's super important to get to know the people's needs. You're trying to solve uh, their problem, not your problem. Okay. So problem stratum is super important. And yes, it could look like that. So employees, who's affected by that? What do they need? They need an engaging, memorable, and easy to understand security awareness training, for example. What's a problem? Well, they're bored and they're distracted by their organization, tedious computer-based e-learning uh, security awareness training. I don't know if you empathize with that. And therefore, they become a big security risk. So in your problem statement, you should just uh, write, explain who's affected, what the needs are, what the problem is, and why that thing really matters. Once you've got that, you know, share this with your team, and everybody has a uh, common understanding of the problem you're trying to solve. And then start thinking about the goals. And that is super important. You have to do that before you actually start thinking about the puzzles and the story. No, we need to know what we're trying to solve. Why are we doing this escape room? What is the overall purpose of the escape room? What are the learning outcomes that we need to achieve? Are we going to be using that to assess uh, students' existing knowledge? Are we going to be using this to introduce students, uh, I don't know, to, to a concept? How are you going to convince people that it did work, that the learning outcomes have been met? How can you quantify or qualify that? Also, do, they, do your learners have the necessary skills to play? How many learning outcomes do you really need without actually overloading uh, the, the players? How long have you got to develop that? How many sessions do you need to be able to uh, involve everybody, make all students, for example, play that game? So once you answer those questions, you can come up with smart goals like this one. So for example, in the next three months, so I know how long I've got, we will design a math-based educational escape room. So I'm super specific. I know that it's going to be about maths. For well, grade five students, so that is my target audience. What is it that it focus on, on problem solving skills? What metrics am I going to be using to uh, justify the success and say that that was actually a successful project? Oh, so at least 75% of the students are going to correctly solve all the puzzles. And how long have they got? One hour. So this is an example of a smart goal. And then you have to think about the learning objectives. So, for example, students should be able to identify uh, the atomic symbol, number, and atomic weight of each element, like the escape room in a postcard we showed earlier. Uh, they might be able to know where to find books in the library, how to use uh, the, the library's printer, uh, how to identify um, phishing emails, how to uh, use Google Maps. I don't know. You think of some learning objectives. You can just go to your uh, module specifications and I'd find some of those. And then once you've got all of this in place, you have to think about the constraints that you've got that are going to affect uh, the development of, the, of your escape game. There could be time, how much time have we got to actually develop that? How much time we have for testing? How much time will players have to play the game? Resources, how much is it gonna cost us to buy stuff or build things? Or are, gonna be, are we gonna be able to use a room for the, how long? which moves on to the space. Do you have the space for that? Safety. You don't want to, uh, you know, lock up your students and then a fire alarm goes off and they're going to just leave the room and, you know, bad things happen, like what happened in, what was it, Poland, I think it was a few years ago. How difficult is the game going to be? Is it going to be, uh, play, will all players be able to solve the puzzles? Accessibility, another important thing. Sometimes you've got puzzles that, uh, you know, they use colors, red, green, and you have someone who might be colorblind. 
so they might not be able to uh, solve those puzzles. The, the alignment, how does it fit to the curriculum? What about the size of our group? How many students do we have uh, can play the, the game at the same time? How much is this going to cost? Also, staff availability. Uh, do we have available staff to run this game? game? And another thing that sometimes we tend to forget is the required knowledge. So I had the uh, uh, the opportunity, so to speak, to play test some of the games developed by, by my students. And although it was explicitly mentioned in the brief that uh, we are not assessing knowledge, we want to educate people. My students assumed that players knew what a Mor what Morse code is or some, you know, what a braille code is. So seriously, the pig pen cipher, scissor cipher, how would they know that? So you need to specify before you actually start designing whether the knowledge that is required to solve the puzzles is going to be explicit. So you give them all the information that they need inside the game. You assume that they already know something, so that could be used for assessment or it could be retrievable. So you expect them to go online and find this information. So that's important to know beforehand. As for group size, ideally group groups of four to six work best. If it's more than that, then it becomes uh, hard to collaborate. Uh, if it's smaller, then you know sometimes people just they get stuck. Some people might say, yeah, but we have too many students and we don't have enough time or enough rooms. That is when uh, a digital room is uh, more convenient because you can ask them to just go play this on their own time at their own space whenever they want. So that could be one way to solve that problem and address this issue. Then you have to decide what type of game you're going to be using. Is it going to be a physical escape room? Is it going to be a breakout box? So instead of escaping from a room, there's a lock box that you have to unlock it and access the, 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 the content. Is it going to be a puzzle hunt? Is it going to be a digital escape room? It could be a hybrid game, both physical and digital components, or is it going to be a serial story? A serial story is like a, instead of having a, watching a film, you watch a TV show. So you have mini escape rooms that you play, I don't know, on a weekly basis, once every two weeks, and they have a storyline that you know, continues from episode to episode, and each one of those addresses different learning outcomes. So you identify, you choose your uh, type of game, then you have to think about how long the game is going to last. Most escape rooms should last, will usually last 60 minutes because that gives you sufficient time to have uh, enough puzzles, enough time for people to get to know each other and work as a team. And also it fits into one hour of instruction. Ideally, if you have a two hour time slot for that, that gives you sufficient time to do proper briefing and debriefing. If you don't have enough time, you can come up with shorter games, of course. Longer games might um, uh, give students with more, uh, provide them with more meaningful challenges, but that usually takes more time and effort, not only to be solved, but also to be developed. So you have to think about that. Also, see, we're talking about defining all of those things, and we haven't even started talking about puzzles or story yet. All of this is the legwork. Some people might find this dull and boring, but ChatGPT can speed up things a lot. And also it's important to know all of this before you actually spend time developing. Uh, so yes, it might be like a chore for some people, but it's important. So you have to figure out where you're gonna place this in a curriculum. Is it gonna be a standalone activity? Something you just as an induction. So first year students, they come to the library and we have an escape room uh, to uh, help them figure out how to use the library resources. Or is it something they'll use in the class? A one-off thing, something that we do at the end of the semester as assessment, something that we do at the beginning as a nice breaker. Is it something that we do uh, 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 in episodes every other week? So define that. And then is where the more fun starts, context. This one actually makes a game an escape game and an interesting experience and not just a, a collection of puzzles just put together. So this is where you can have to come up with a, with a storyline. So you have to think about it, decide about a theme. This is what is going to set the tone and feel for your game. This could be a treasure hand, could be a mystery game, could be a horror game, paranormal, sci-fi, whatever you want. 
And then you think about the setting. Where is this going to take place? When and where? To make it engaging. And once you've done that, you have to think about the story. So your story actually is important because this is what actually is going to make your players care about the characters. They would like to they would like to carry on playing the game to solve a mystery of sorts. So it's important, it's motivating. And again, you can use ChatGPT to help you come up with a story. Uh, I keep on mentioning that because it speeds up the whole process very much. I'm not saying that story ChatGPT is going to write a, a, a Stephen King novel, no, but it's going to help you if you get stuck, okay? So once you come up with your plot, it's important to be able to answer those questions. So your players are locked up in a room, right? Why? They need to know that to make it more immersive as an experience, more more engaging and motivating. How did they get there? What do they need to do to, to escape or to succeed? What happens if they do not escape? Why should they care? What are they going to get? What are the rewards? Why should they do that? They say, oh, you've got only 60 minutes. Why? Why do I need to hurry? I need to know that. Oh, yeah, we've got the puzzles in the room and clues. Yeah, we can see that. But why are they there? Who put them there? Who left those clues? Some logic has to be there, you know, to make it believable. How do all of those things fit into the story? If you do have a game master, which is very likely, then who's this person? Why is that person there? Why is that person giving hints to the players? So there has to be some logic, okay? That it should make sense. And uh, I'm not going to get into much depth about the three act structure, narrative, and storytelling, and all that, but. Um, uh, there's something called a fright pyramid and also the three-act structure. This is something that you see in movies and books and all that with regard to narrative elements and storytelling. So in the first act, what we call exposition is where you give your players the background information about the characters, about the setting, about what happens in the game. So this should actually take place uh, during uh, the briefing. Then during the escape room, the, the actual gameplay, you have what we call the resonant action. You know, there's more tension to the players, and there's a climax because it's a final puzzle. And there's always a conflict. So usually there's a villain, there's a main antagonist to the story to make it interesting. No conflict, no fun. And the final puzzle should actually lead to the resolution, uh, which normally takes the form of a video. So you can have a video introduction to the game at the beginning. Uh, to get people, you know, hyped, you know, pumped up, they want to play the game, but there has to be some closure. Like in every film, you want to know what happens next. So one way to do that is you know, just producing a video uh, to let people know what happens in the characters, what happened to the main antagonist. You can even make them make a choice, moral choices. Should actually uh, the bad guy? Should we actually arrest the person? Should we actually let the person go? What should we do? This could be an interesting thing to have a debate afterwards and discussion with the students if you want to have some morals uh, as part of the story. And this takes place at the big, uh, at the debriefing session. And then decide about the story format, if it's going to be a standalone game or if you want to plan this as an episode, use an episodic format. So you have snackable content, you know, let's say, 30 minute game or a 50 minute game every two weeks or something and ends with a cliffhanger. Each one of those games addresses a couple of, I don't know, learning objectives, but it builds up the whole story. And you want the players want to know what happens at the end. So they'll keep on playing every other week. So you decide what select format suits your audience and your needs. Then you think about the environment. The location is this going to take place in a room, in a classroom, in a lab, outside, on a computer. If it's a physical escape room, you have to think about the decoration, the props, sound is important, lighting is important if we're talking about a physical escape room, uh, video to make it more uh, immersive so you can produce videos uh, the beginning and the end of the game. Sometimes by just by asking the players to wear costumes, that makes it a more immersive game experience. I remember once we had an escape room and we played the role of Knight Templar. So we had a Halloween costume and everybody wore that and people love that. So yeah, if you have the budget for this, why not? And then it's the hardest part for many people is 
coming up with the puzzles. So the different types of puzzles, of course, you've got the cognitive puzzles, you know, they make people think. Uh, this could be part recognition, spatial puzzles, uh, you know, things with numbers. Uh, and you've got text, of course, riddles, mazes, connected dots. By the way, these appear to be in yellow because these are links. If you click on this, it takes you to a Wikipedia entry that explains what the things are in case, for example, somebody doesn't know what a nonogram is or paint by numbers, they can just click on that and, and find out. Ciphers, they've been done to death in escape games. Uh, we actually, in the morning, we there was a uh, puzzle that used Braille code, or this is a cipher that's also been done to death, along with a pig pen cipher or Morse code. So yeah, you can use encryption, uh, but it's a good thing to have a variety of puzzles. So it's a good thing if we're talking about a physical escape room, you have also some physical puzzles, some tasks that you actually have to manipulate some items, you know, from doing knots to moving objects, you know, using magnets, mirrors, or what have you, uh, hidden objects, find things under, under a table, locks. And then you've got puzzles that require more, you know, more than one body. That is uh, also very fun if you're working as a group and you can hide, let's say, uh, a key somewhere it's too high and that requires someone to go on someone else's shoulder so they can uh, access that, uh, that key. That makes it more fun and more memorable. And also they have to collaborate, like it or not. And also you got the sensory puzzles. These are puzzles that uh, do not really just upon what you see. It could be, uh, you can use black light invisible ink you can use sound we had puzzles where you can all you could hear was the sound of um wind and thunder that is two states dot dash morse code one way to use morse code in a, you know one more creative way let's say to use morse code or we had other case of puzzles where we use some uh musical notes and then a b c d e and then you uh, somehow find those letters and they spell a word and you use that to open a lock. I played an escape game where actually they locked me up and it was pitch black. And, you know, that's one good thing about having a big nose. I had to smell, follow my, the, the smell. It was dark. I could not see anything. So it just went like a band like that. And I reached something that was smelly. That was actually chips. And I was just, I could feel that. And inside that ball, there was a, a button, you press the button, let there be light, and that's on the light. And I also found a key that allowed me to remove my handcuffs. So yeah, you can, that is memorable because it's kind of different and original. So if you can somehow incorporate puzzles that use other senses, you know, like smell or hearing and all that, yeah, by all means do that. Uh, then of course you've got technology. From QR codes that are being used to death, just make sure that it kind of fits to the theme of your game. It's common sense, but you know, unless you believe in the ancient uh, uh, aliens theory, uh, finding a QR code in a pyramid is probably not likely. Okay, so just make sure that they fit your theme. Of the uh, also, if you plan to use AR or VR, man, that's expensive. Remember, if something, if someone drops the VR headset down and it breaks, yeah, good luck with that. Make sure that also uh, the technology does not fail you, and always have a backup plan. So if you have a a USB key, for example, doesn't work for whatever reason, have a backup to give it to the players when they play. And finally, we've got the meta puzzle, which is a puzzle that unites all the other puzzles that players have solved uh, throughout the game. That is usually the final puzzle in the game. And you use, I don't know, clues from previous puzzles and you bring them together and they give you the answer to the final puzzle. So that is a structure that you can follow uh, when designing puzzles. And with regard to some of the puzzles and principles, your puzzles to be memorable and effective, they have to be relevant, of course, to the learning objectives and all that. They have to be challenging, no too easy, no too hard, go to log zone. And you always, you should always start with an easy puzzle so that they get an easy first win. They become motivated and they become confident in themselves. If the first puzzle is too hard, they're going to be demotivated. They might think, wow, the first puzzle is so hard. God only knows how hard the next puzzle is going to be. So... No, I'm not going to be doing that. So give them an easy win. Onboarding the players, super important. Make sure that they get clues and hints if they get stuck. Uh, think about the flow. 
Uh, low is, I'm going to butcher this guy's name, Chechi Mikai or something like that, came up with this kind of concept. Well, as I mentioned, it has to be not too hard, not too easy. If you manage to somehow maintain this balance, then you enter this state of, state of cognitive flow, you lose track of time and have a great time. The puzzles you know, have to be integrated to the storyline, somehow connected to the real world if possible. There's going to be variety because I remember last week I played a game and it was five puzzles. Each one of them was an encryption puzzle. And I said, you know, uh, it's not as if this is a course on cryptography. This is a course on what, what was it? I don't remember. It was maths, I think. Why should I have to decrypt all the time? There's no variety there. Boring. Scala scalability. Yeah, that's the guy, Claire. Yeah. Uh, scalability. So you have to think, of, I designed this puzzle to be played by this group of students, with groups of four. But what happens if I get more students? Or what happens if I get students from abroad whose English is not, uh, you know, the first language, the proper um, mother language? What, are gonna, what, what can I do about that? And of course, safety. You do not want anybody to get hurt while they try to solve your puzzles. Okay. What you should avoid is uh, puzzles that rely heavily on language or culture, specific knowledge, especially unless we are assessing something, and of course, luck. Also, sometimes you might have a puzzle that does not have a definite solution. Um, we saw one of those puzzles earlier this morning. All puzzles that make people guess. You don't want them, your players, to guess. Technology, that can be problematic. I played a game, they used a QR code, but because the printer that was used to print out that QR code, uh, well, the, the ink level was low. As a result, the contrast between the white of the paper and the black, no, it was actually light gray, of uh, the QR code was uh, not enough, so my phone could not pick it up. So double check that technology is not going to fail you. And of course, red herrings. Red herring is when you have something that is not part of the game, just there to confuse players and make them, you know, waste their time. This might work in a PC game because you want your game to be long, but I'm against using that in an educational game because people, players, they lose track of time, they, they get frustrated. So just avoid at all costs. That would be my recommendation to you. Decide about what structure you're going to be using for your puzzles. The easiest thing to do, especially if you're now starting to design a escape room, is to follow this linear approach. Because, yeah, the good thing about that is that let's assume that we have a learning objective one, learning objective two, learning objective three. All the players, in order to beat the game, they will have to solve those puzzles, which means that they will all have to achieve those learning objectives. If you instead use another type of um, structure, for example, let's say the open structure, a group of players might solve the first puzzle only, then another group of players might solve the second puzzle, and the third group of students might solve the third puzzle. So they're going to be missing out of the other learning objectives. Not to mention the fact that it's going to be harder to time. Because with a linear structure, if you assume that yeah, it's going to be about five minutes per puzzle, if you have three puzzles, that should take you about 15 minutes. With the open uh, structure, if groups work in parallel, it could be just five minutes for the whole game which means that, uh-oh, I run out of time. I need to come up with more puzzles. So unless you're more experienced, I would say that you should just stick to the, um, to the linear structure, at least for now. The problem with this one is that sometimes, you know, players get stuck in a puzzle and they get demotivated. This is why you should have some kind of a hint system and help them out uh, in case they get stuck. It, it also helps a lot if you draw a room map with a, uh, where the clues are going to be and how the puzzle is going to be arranged. So you can have a, a flow of a game. You can even use post-it notes or cards with details about each puzzle, uh, what objects you have in every location, what actually prompts the players to start working on a puzzle, what clue or reward takes the players from one puzzle to another. It's very convenient. It's going to help you as a team to have you know, at a glance to know how your game is going to be structured. And I recommend that people use their one clue, one use rule. That means that let's assume that as part of my game, I find a smartphone. I want to use that only once for one puzzle, and then it's out of the game. I don't have to worry about that. I know that I've solved this. I don't have to think about this anymore. That is going to help me save time. Otherwise, you might think, okay, do I need to use this again? 
So you get to start thinking again, which means that you might lose time. One clue, one use, and everything's going to be fine. And then think about the assets that you're going to be using, all the props, from the technology to the boxes, if we're talking about physical escape room, to the locks, to the video, audio, the print documents, soundtrack, important, you know, music. Uh, also, sometimes you have to have some actors or uh, the lecturers, I don't know, how somebody else to get involved uh, to give uh, hints to the students. So you have to think about that. Advice, use cheap stuff. It's things that, you know, if you break it, it's easy to replace. Um, and hint system, super important. If players get stuck and they have no help, they get really frustrated. They lose, they, you know, they don't want to play anymore. So you have to find a way to give them hints. One way to do that could be, you know, you have an NPC in the game, non-playing character, you have a, the game's master, someone who's there where they play the game and gives them hints. So if they get stuck, they ask for a hint and that person answers them, try to help them out. Or you can create some, produce some videos and you can make them pl play on the TV screen. Or if you want to, if you don't have time for that and you want to keep things as cheap as possible, what you can do is write hints, put them in an envelope, and write, you know, uh, open after 15 minutes, open after 30 minutes. So if they get stuck and 15 minutes have passed and they haven't solved that problem yet, they can open the envelope that gives them a hint or even the solution to the puzzle. You might even, if you make a digital escape room, uh, you might have a, a hint button with a cooldown timer, or you can even, you know, uh, penalize the players for using hints. That depends. If you also you want to use a, a scoring system. So you can award a final score based on whether they managed to escape, how long it took them, how many hints they used, how many puzzles they solved. Sometimes you might want to actually punish players uh, for making errors. And let's imagine that uh, you are making an escape room about you know, for medical students and uh, they have to know the exact dosage that you know, they can inject to someone. If they use the wrong dosage, that person dies. So it's super important that they don't get this wrong. So it makes sense to punish them if they get that wrong so that they will never forget. I remember once we had an escape room about cybersecurity and I, I planted a USB key in the room. So the players, they found it, they plugged it in. The moment they did that, red screen, uh, 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 uh. you lost five minutes of your time because you should never put a USB that you do not know where it comes from to your computer. They were not happy about that, but they remember, okay? So punishment can be good sometimes. And then once we've done all of this work, so we've finished with all the fun, we come up with the ideas, with the puzzles, uh, with the story. Let's think about the briefing. The briefing is, think of it as a trailer to a film. What is the purpose of a trailer? to make you all pumped up, you make you want to actually go and watch the film to the movie, in the movie theater, okay? So think of it something similar with a briefing session. So there should be one way, this is one way to introduce your players to the story of the game and make them feel excited. Also that they should also know the rules of the game, what they should do, what they should not be doing, and also inform them about the backstory and everything. You can have a script that you read to the students. The lazy thing, the laziest thing to do is write something, give it to them to read, and not engaging but I've, I know some of my students have done that. But the more immersive thing is produce a video. Not a long thing, one minute video, that should do. ChatGPT can create a script for your video as well with timings and everything, okay? So again, you might want to use that. With ty what type of shot to use, the angles and everything, it does wonders, if you know how to use it, that is. And then you have to think about debriefing. So, um, Dedicate, that is the most important part of the escape room. It's not the game itself, it's the debriefing session. Because this is going to give you the opportunity to see if any learning actually took place. If, start with an outro video to, you know, uh, wrap up the story, book ending, so they know what happened at the end. But then use that time to have a discussion with the students, with the learners about the puzzles, what they learn, the whole experience, give them some feedback on their performance, ask them to reflect on their own experience. And you can also use that as an opportunity to give them something. So let's say we did a, an escape room about um, uh, the period you could have of elements. There you go, you played that, 
here's a leaflet or a PDF or whatever that explains the things that were covered in the game so that you remember that. You have something, uh, for example, I find a lock and I try all combinations to open it. This is what we call a brute force attack. I've done it, but I don't know how it's called. So if you give me that leaflet at the end that explains brute force attack is this and that and that, oh, now I know what I've done uh, is called brute force attack. Okay, so that's one way to reinforce learning activity. During this debriefing session, to get feedback, you can use a plus delta model. So you just, you know, go uh, on a uh, um, chart on a board, uh, put a plus sign and put there in post-it notes all the things that they told you that work really well, what they enjoyed about that. And in the delta sign on the other side of the uh, of the board, all the things that could be improved, what we did not like, what we think we should improve in the next iteration of the game. And then you can use that, you can um, use thematic analysis to get the data, uh, to analyze the data and figure out what you should do next. Don't forget group photo, because that is actually the most, the only shareable thing about this experience. So it's a souvenir, people like that. Bragging rights as well. They can use on social media, Instagram, Facebook and all that. And uh, yeah, give them something that fits to the theme of the game, of the room. So as I said, Knights Templar. Yeah, there you go. Put this Halloween costume and take a photo with that. I'm just giving you a couple of minutes warning because yeah, 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 yeah. time for questions. Brilliant. Don't worry. Yeah, yeah, I'm finishing. So prototype is the next thing. Fail fast, fail cheap. Use only pen and paper at the beginning. Don't spend time on expensive props. It's very, very likely that by the end of the first iteration of your game, uh, the prototype, you're going to be removing lots of stuff and coming up with new ideas. So low fidelity prototypes are as cheap as possible. Then once you're happy with that, high fidelity prototype and do not forget to write guides. So the instructions that someone needs to run the game and also to set up and repack the whole game. And finally, oh, we've got the play testing. And make sure that you have um, you address the play time, the difficult level, the puzzle mechanics, the quality of hints, super important. And how everything is to uh, the learning objectives. And then we come to the evaluation. How are we going to be able to say if we met our objectives and and uh, learning outcomes? So some math, some techniques. One is the pre-post and delayed post test. What I mean by that is, let's assume that we have um, an escape game about cybersecurity. Come up with a quiz with questions about uh, the things that you're actually uh, using in, in your game. Give your players the opportunity to do that before they play the game. Make them play the game. Do not give them all the right answers. After they play the game, you give them the exact same test, and then you compare those. If the second time they did the test, they scored higher than the first time, that means that they learned something. Because the only thing that happened being in between those two tests was uh, the, uh, the game. And then given the exact same test for the third time, let's say two weeks later, three weeks later, if the third time round they score higher than the first time, that means that I remember, that's retention. Okay? And of course, you can do the surveys and the interviews and the focus groups and all that, like you could do in any other project. And that's it. So I had to rush the end. But uh, I have lots of stuff because my time was limited. So I have a version that has 202 slides that covers chat GPT prompts, puzzle design ideas, all stuff about learning theories, constructivism, uh, gardener's theory of multiple sets, what you name it, it's going to be there. So if you want access to that, go to Bitly and then add after this in uppercase, the secret message in the slides. Has anybody found that? That is correct. Too long PPTX. That's correct. Yes, Kathy, you've got that. All of this to a too long PPTX, no spaces in uppercase. If you use that, it's going to take you to that long version of the PDF. And that's it. Thank you for your time. Any questions? Thank you so much. And I missed that completely. Ethan and I on the chat. So well done, Kathy, and anybody else. And um, Alice, you got it as well. So yes, please do um, put some questions in the chat or come on mic. You should all be able to. And because we have to end up with a quote, here's a quote that I really like and I found really inspiring. They will never forget how you made them feel. So if they have fun when they did that, yeah, they will never forget this. <laughs>